All right, our next topic is postpartum hemorrhage. Postpartum hemorrhage is a major cause of maternal mortality and morbidity, particularly in developing countries. If you ever read James Michener's book, Hawaii, and missionaries from America went around the tip of South America and went to Hawaii, one of the missionaries married a Hawaiian woman who conceived and got pregnant in Maui. And in Maui, she had her labor supervised by the traditional birth attendants. She delivered fine, but she was bleeding postpartum. And the traditional birth attendants got various herbs and their traditional uh, remedies, and she bled, and she bled, and she bled, and she died. Just gradual trickling of her life away. Postpartum hemorrhage is a major concern. Let's look at the various causes, risk factors, clinical findings, and management. And this is what you need to know for the USMLE exam. Risk factors, clinical findings, and management. Clearly the most common cause of postpartum hemorrhage is an atonic uterus, 50% of the time. If you're given an exam case with a postpartum hemorrhage and given no other information, you can assume it is probably an atonic uterus. What are the risk factors? Well, we can classify this into an overworked uterus, an infected uterus, a relaxed uterus, and an overdistended uterus. Overworked uterus, a rapid labor. Patient comes in, she's four centimeters dilated, half an hour, ready, she, uh, half an hour later, she's ready to push. You better be prepared. A prolonged labor. She came in, membranes ruptured, cervix uneffaced, no contractions. She's had oxytocin for 24 hours you better be prepared for an atonic uterus. An infected uterus doesn't contract well. Chorioamnionitis, a relaxed uterus. Now what can relax the uterus? Medications, and these you should certainly know. Magnesium sulfate, which is used for prevention of seizures postpartum with preeclamptic patients, that can relax the uterus. Beta adrenergic agonists, such as ritodrine terbutaline. Halothane, a... Uh, Anesthetic gas, which is used, can relax the uterus. And then all of the causes of an overdistended uterus, twins, triplets, polyhydramnios, or a big baby, macrosomia. So all of these are risk factors for uterine atony. Clinical finding. The most common clinical finding is a doughy, soft uterus. It feels like my belly. Now you may have abs of steel, but if it feels soft and doughy, and particularly if it's above the umbilicus, you think atonic uterus. It should be below the umbilicus, it should be firm. Also, sometimes it can be deviated off the midline. First thing you should do when a patient is having postpartum hemorrhage is to feel for the uterus. What's the management? Clearly the first thing you should do is uterine massage. Then you give your medications, but first, massage. And this is frequently a bored question. Your hand is already on the abdomen. The uterus feels soft and boggy, massage it. Then you go with your medications, and typically we'll start with oxytocin. Now we will usually give that for a couple hours after delivery anyway. Methogen ergotamine is probably our next line. And then, if that doesn't work, we go with the prostaglandins. And the prostaglandin that we use is prostaglandin F2-alpha. And if you really want to be anal, it is prostaglandin F2-alpha-15-methyl. And the term that we use is heme abate. Heme abate. Bleeding, heme abate. Abate the bleeding. Stop the bleeding. This is given IM. So, if the uterus feels like dough, soft, boggy, you think, atonic uterus. Here's bimanual uterine massage. I'm sorry, Mrs. Jones, this is gonna be very uncomfortable, but you're bleeding. We've gotta stop it. Now, remember, a baby's head just came out through the vagina. 
so the hand can fit in there. But this can be very uncomfortable. But massage is the first thing you must do. Let's say you're doing a cesarean and you have a uterus that doesn't want to contract. You can use what is called a B. Lynch suture. And B. Lynch is named after the physician who first described it. You put a suture through the lower uterine segment, over the top of the fundus, come down the back, go in again, come up over, and you essentially cinch down the uterus. It's like suspenders. It's clamping it down. And that can help preserve the uterus, which otherwise may need to be taken out. Now here's a case that I did this on a short while ago, and you can see how it helps the uterus to contract down. B. Lynch suture. So the most common cause of postpartum hemorrhage is a tonic uterus. Numero dos is the genital lacerations, 20%. Risk factors, what would cause lacerations? Uncontrolled vaginal delivery. Patient comes in, no prenatal care, out of control, six centimeters dilating, pushing, pushing, and screaming. All of a sudden, the baby goes, pops right out. And her perineum looks like a grenade just went off. Uncontrolled vaginal delivery. A traumatic vaginal delivery. Shoulder dystocia, macrosomia. Operative vaginal delivery, forceps, vacuum extractor. All of these uh, are risk factors. And this patient needs to be examined carefully. We insist that the vagina, the cervix, the perineum be examined looking for lacerations. Bleeding in the presence of a contracted uterus. Medical or surgical management. Surgical management. Suture it. But you can hardly suture something that you don't see. So we want to check the cervix if there is a, a laceration two centimeters or more in length, or if it's bleeding, we're going to put in sutures and bring it together. If you don't, you could end up with an incompetent cervix or cervical insufficiency. Retain placenta, not as common as lacerations or as a, a tonic uterus, but still occurs 10% of the time. Risk factors for retained placenta. Accessory lobe, a succinturiate lobe. This is where it's important to examine the maternal and the fetal side of the placenta. Is there a blood vessel that goes out over the membranes that would suggest that there could be an accessory lobe in the uterus? Placenta accreta, where the villi have invaded deeper than they should, that would be unlikely, that's rare. Clinical findings, missing cotyledons on the placenta, I'll show you what that looks like, in the presence of a contracted uterus. And is this surgical or medical management? Is it surgical? Take it out. Either manually remove it or do a curatage, a scraping under ultrasound guidance. Examine the placenta. This is looking at the fetal side of the placenta, and you see these vessels stop at the edge. They do not run over the membranes. Check to make sure that all of the uh, cotyledons are present on the fetal side of the placenta. Now, some people take the placenta home and put it into uh, their rose garden. Many places will actually sell or give the placentas to cosmetic companies that will extract the steroids. Placental extract gives skin the resources to reconstruct itself. Everything is possible. Here's a patient who had an accessory lobe. You can see this is a single fetus right here. And here's an anterior placenta and a posterior placenta. How could you have two placentas with a single fetus? Well, they had a bilobed placenta. And so I, on my report, recommended to the physician, be sure you take out both lobes. This is the kind of instrument we use for scraping out the uterus if there is retained placenta. This is called a hunter's curette. And we put this into the uterus and we will gently, you don't want to perforate the uterus, remove under ultrasound guidance the uh, uh, retained products of conception. And this is the hunter's curette. Now we move to the more rare causes of uh, 
postpartum bleeding, obstetrical DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. And there are four of the most common ones you should be aware of. Well, DIC is not common itself. The most common one is abruptual placenta. Now that would be a good board question. The most common obstetrical cause of DIC is abruptual placenta. Severe preeclampsia, remember we talked about that? You have low platelets, prolonged PTT. Amniotic fluid embolus is an unusual uh, situation where you can get DIC and prolonged retention of a dead fetus. So those would be the four risk factors, the most common being abruption. Findings, generalized oozing. You're doing a cesarean and you have bleeding. You put in a suture, you tie it. There's more bleeding from the site of the uh, suture needle than there was to begin with. So you put another suture in. There's more bleeding from that than you had to begin with. And suddenly it dawns on you, hey, I wonder if she's got DIC. Let's say she has an IV, which was fine, and now she's bleeding from the IV site. Petechiae, in the presence of a contracted uterus. What do you do for DIC? Remove the products of conception, any placental tissue, any membranes, take out the placenta, then ICU care up to the intensive care unit, and then selected blood products as needed. Fresh frozen plasma, platelets, packed red blood cells, whatever you need. And generally, a healthy young woman, even though she's got DIC, can recover pretty quickly and will do well. This is a rare cause of postpartum hemorrhage, uterine inversion. The first thing you want to do when this patient has postpartum hemorrhage is to feel for the uterus. And guess what? You can't feel it. Now the uterus is large. It should be up to the umbilicus. We call organomegaly. You should be able to feel it. If you can't, you better think, maybe she's got an inverted uterus. Risk factor. I think it is probably myometrial weakness, and I'll show you why I think that's the case. If she said on her obstetrical history previously, you know, my uterus turned inside out on my last delivery, you better be prepared that it could happen again. Clinical findings, what you should remember. Coming through the vagina is what is often described as a beefy bleeding mass a beefy bleeding mass, and what this is, is the fundus of the uterus turned inside out, and you're seeing the top of the fundus coming out. I'll show you a picture in just a minute. And you cannot palpate the uterus. The management here is to replace the uterus in its normal anatomic position. You elevate the vaginal fornices, get the uterus back in its more anatomic orientation, and then give IV oxytocin to contract it. So here we have the endometrium, which is in red. A dimple forms on the top of the uterus. It gets deeper, and you can see the endometrium is moving toward the cervix. And here it is turned inside out completely. This is your beefy bleeding mass. And it is the inside of the uterus which has come out. What you want to do is to push the uterus back into its normal physiologic position. And here is where we have the vaginal fornices and we elevate this. We lift the uterus and get it back into its normal position. And then with the oxytocin, help the uterus to contract. The important thing is to recognize it because once the cervix constricts, it can make it almost impossible to get that back up. Some people think that uterus inverts because you put too much traction on the cord and you pull down on the fundus. I've seen so many times students and residents pull the cord so hard, they pull it right off. How often have you seen in inversion of the uterus? I've maybe seen three or four in my 25 years, so it's not very common at all. Okay, the last topic is uterus is firm, not atonic. You have checked for lacerations, no lacerations. You have uh, looked to see if there's retained placenta, no retained placenta, no DIC, no inverted uterus. What's going on? I don't know. She's still bleeding. What's the management, medical or surgical? 
This is now surgical. We're going to start ligating vessels, the uterine vessels, the internal iliac vessels, and you may even need to do a hysterectomy. But you better know your anatomy, you better know your territory, or you're going to get into trouble going retroperitoneally here. And what we want to do is to ligate the uterine artery in two spots because there is anastomosis from the ovarian vessels and from the uterine artery here. So you want to ligate on both sides, on both sides. Now you say, my goodness, we're tying off the blood supply to the uterus, it's going to infarct. There is such tremendous collateral circulation in the pelvis that you're not going to get ischemia of the uterus. You may reduce the head of pressure by maybe 75 to 80 percent, but that may be all you need to do. If you get hypotension because of postpartum hemorrhage, for any reason, you may get Sheehan syndrome. So remember, postpartum hemorrhage, ischemia of the anterior pituitary, anterior pituitary insufficiency. Now what's going to be the first symptom you'll see with this? It's going to be loss of which tropic hormone? It's going to be prolactin. She won't breastfeed. She won't have any milk production. Then subsequently, the hormones which will follow, depending on the severity, is your gonadotropins, FSH, LH, and then if it's complete infarction, TSH and ACTH. But those are going to be quite rare. All right, let's summarize what we have just said. Here in the middle of this table are our differential diagnoses. The questions which are unique to the diagnosis are on the left side, and on the right side is our management. If you cannot palpate the uterus, you better think of uterine inversion. That is rare. Elevate the vaginal fornices, oxytocin to contract the uterus, and to keep it uh, from repeating its inversion. The most common cause of postpartum hemorrhage is uterine atony. The uterus feels soft. It feels boggy. It feels like dough. We talked about all the risk factors for that, an overdistended uterus, an infected uterus, an overworked uterus. The first thing you want to do is uterine massage first. Then we have oxytocin, ergotamine, and the prostaglandin 15-methyl F2-alpha. Lacerations, 20%. Examine carefully. Look for tears of the vagina of the cervix. If you find them, fix them. Repair them. Retain placenta. Examine the placenta, the maternal side, the fetal side. If the placenta is incomplete, you need to go in after it under ultrasound guidance, manual removal, or curatage. The rare causes of postpartum hemorrhage, DIC, diffuse oozing. You better think of uh, post uh, or a DIC. Uh, check the uh, blood. Does she have thrombocytopenia? Does she have uh, prolonged PTPTT? Remove products of conception, ICU care, and selected blood products as needed. If there is unexplained persistent bleeding, then you need to do surgical management, ligation of the uterine arteries, of the internal iliac vessels, and if necessary, a total abdominal hysterectomy, although that is really rare. And that is the end of postpartum hemorrhage.